we start? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so for those who are just tuning in, we are on um, section four of chapter one in our second video, diving into reading and reviewing and commenting on Sean McMeekin's book, Stalin's War. Uh, so we, in the last video, we covered our uh, sort of interwar Soviet foreign policy, the diplomatic capture of other European states, as well as with the Chinese, and the infiltration of Washington and sort of the basic conclusion that Joe McCarthy was right and that FDR was kind of naive in his approach towards Stalin and Soviet foreign policy. But before I get any further, uh, Mr. Raging Mantrel, welcome back. How are you, sir? I'm doing excellent. How are you? I'm doing great. Happy to continue our series into arguably one of the most important historical texts that has come out in recent years. It's a hefty volume, but I think it's important for us to understand that you know, all these sort of communist tanky myths about Soviet industrialization and the power of Stalinization is a, an acute communist myth. People tell one another that if it wasn't for American guns, dollars, corn and gas, uh, the Eastern Front would have been a totally different story. And that is something that I think needs to be reiterated as we see this reemergence of uh, communist myth making. So we're, we're going to just get right into it. All right. All right. Uh, chapter four or section four, chapter one, behind the popular front. Diplomatic recognition in Washington was an important milestone in the Soviet efforts to improve the position of communism abroad. The advent of a rival totalitarian regime in Berlin after Hitler's ascension to power in January 1933, followed by the brutal Nazi crackdown against communists in the wake of the Reichstag fire in February 28 offered Stalin an ideological foil to polish his own image. A symbiotic relationship developed between Nazi Germany and communist Russia, with both sides exploiting each other's atrocities for propaganda while quietly collaborating behind the scenes on matters of mutual interest, as in the turning over of political opponents for the arrest or the exchange of VIP prisoners. In a striking episode of cooperation, Hitler's government arranged a special plane out of Germany for Grigory Dimitrov, one of the communist defendants charged with setting the Reichstag fire after Dimitrov was accused, acquitted in Leipzig in court in December 1933. Exonerated by the Nazis after a courtroom clash with Hitler's Prussian minister president and Gestapo chief, Ermin Goring, which some suspect to have been staged, Dimitrov returned to triumph in Moscow in 1934 whereupon Stalin promoted him to the general secretary of the Comintern. There was much uh, for each dictator to learn from the other. Hitler shocked the world by having leading members of his party's paramilitary uh, Sturmabteilung, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, ladies and gents. Sturmabteilung. There you go. Murdered on the night of the Long Knives of June 30, 1934, in order to reassure the commanders of the German army that he would respect its preeminence. Stalin then unleashed his own terror in the wake of the murder of Leningrad Communist Party boss Sergei Kirov on December 1, 1934, which ultimately engulfed the upper ranks of the Communist Party leadership and the secret police. Hitler and Stalin also quietly revived trade ties in May 1933, renewing the Berlin Treaty of April 1926, which ensured that the Soviets would continue to pay down bills incurred for German imports during the Rapallo era. In the battle for world opinion, the relationship was less evenly balanced. The Nazis made little effort to conceal their crimes against human decency, from the notorious book burnings of May 1933, to the post-Reichstag fire mass interments of communists and socialists, to the increasingly overt Nazi attacks on Jews and Jewish-owned businesses, to the creation of the first concentration camp, to, Hitler's ha uh, to house Hitler's political enemies at Dachau. Hitler even voluntarily withdrew Germany from the League of Nations in October 1933 in defiance of its refusal to allow Germany to rearm on equal terms with other great powers. Germany was replaced, in a sense, by the USSR, which joined the League in September 1934 on the strength of the U.S. diplomatic recognition and French lobbying to rope Stalin into a mutual assistance pact against Hitler. By contrast... Oh, go ahead. Stop. So this is where Macon... Uh, has very obvious boomer truth leanings. This is this is his most blue pilled, I think, uh, throughout the entire book. Um, a because he doesn't get into uh, the uh, what was being burned um, for you know the Nuremberg book burning 
nor does he really uh, talk about you know anything in the Reichstag fire. He doesn't really get into that in in too much detail here. But what you can well, he see, is, he is definitely building off what I would what we would call consensus political history of the the Nazi regime. I, Sean McMeekin, for all intents and purposes, is not David Irving. Yeah, he, he's not entirely uh, uh, our guy in that respect. Um, but he is, uh, and what he does do throughout the book is he, he, he does set the stage and he makes use of very crucial information and makes people ask questions. But as we can see from this paragraph, you can begin uh, to see this is 10 years before or eight years before the, the war begins. All, all three power blocks, liberal democracy in, in France, USSR and Stalin and Hitler are all jockeying. You, everybody who's familiar with the NRX triangle understands this very uh, intuitively at this point. And you can kind of see diplomatically this play out here in, in just this little paragraph at the end. So that, that's an interesting uh, thing to, to notice just right off the, off the bat at the start of this chapter. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the important thing to consider from an international relations perspective is is that both the USSR and Hitler's regime are opting for ways to get up on one another. I mean, to me, I'm I'm reminded of things such as the bargaining model of war, or even what Megan wrote in the first three sections of this chapter that you know the Soviets will abide by the rules of treaties and agreements if they're too weak to to change the terms or if it just benefits them. But at the same time, uh, you know, Hitler's Germany is looking to rearm and to defend itself against an increasing uh, pressure from the international community to, you know, stay disarmed and just and to stay weakened. I mean, this is at the same time that, um, you know, while America, of course, has a potential, a potentially more isolationist perspective, although we're gallivanting about in, in Central and South America at this time, as uh, Bill Williams will tell you, an empire is a way of life. Uh, you're, you're beginning to see the sort of classic um, sort of bilateral rivalry. But in this instance, uh, Germany doesn't have the benefit of it just being Soviet versus Germany. It's you have to deal with uh, France and you have to deal with Britain, who are growing increasingly concerned about a, a rearming and more, you know, pro-German expansionist view of a empire that had viewed itself as humiliated on the world stage. And I mean, the taking advantage of economic depression, taking advantage of open communist violence and unknown levels of debauchery in Berlin. Yeah, you have the opportunity to to seize power as he did. Um, and here, um, you know, we're just setting the stage for how the Soviets and the, um, you know, the the Third Reich are going to interact with one another. But here we see the, the Soviets really start to, to take a play and benefit off one another until, of course, things go for a turn for the worse between this quote-unquote relationship let's continue on uh let's see here by contrast the soviet government made no public acknowledgement of the concentration camps in which had been interning enemies of the people since 1918 much less of the burgeoning gulag forced labor network which dwarfed the embryonic nazi camps in scale and economic importance or of the Ukrainian or Kazakh famine genocides, or at first of Stalin's post Kirov affair purges, until the public show trials began in August 1936. Uh, well, that probably also helps that you had Walter Durante and the American Paper of Record give you nothing but nonstop apologia. While some Russians, lucky enough to escape Stalin's prison state, and a few Western visitors have been brave enough to question the claims of their regime-provided minders, published probing critiques of the Soviet famine genocide of the early 1930s and the Great Terror, these accounts were overshadowed by the Stalin-friendly Stalin -friendly journalists like the New York Times' Walter Taranti and fellow travelers such as George Bernard <laughs> Shaw. Uh, yeah, I, I complain about one thing, and then it's right there in the next paragraph. Thank you, Mr. McMeekin. Uh, there was a double standard when it came to the public exposure of the crimes of Hitler and Stalin that began in 1933 and continues on in the historical literature just to this day. So um, there's an interesting, so, so um, yeah, right. Uh, but there's an interesting footnote that mcbeacon has got here um, where he's talking about the Kirov uh, purges. And he says, there's one exception in April, 1935, the Soviet government made public a decree extending the death penalty for offenses against the state to minors as young as 12 years old. This allowed Stalin to threaten his political opponents with the murder of their children. 
So just let that sink in. Yeah, I mean, you don't. You you can go to prison, but if you don't confess to your crimes against the state, I will. I will kill your kid. Uh, yeah. I. I we we live in a in a world where. I mean, both you know, both both of these. I I, I will play the both sidism here. I mean, both are evil. One is inherently more evil. Uh. The contrast in perceptions of Nazi and Soviet foreign policy was just as extreme. With domestic repression, Hitler scarcely bothered to conceal his designs, overturning the Versailles Treaty of 1919 and the reparations burden it imposed on Germany, pursuing German rearmament and revising German, Germany's truncated post-World War I borders in the East. Combined with Nazi brutality at home, Hitler's rearmament drive and the assertive foreign policy allowed Stalin and his commissar of foreign affairs, Maxim Litvinov, to pose as the principal opponents of German aggression, winning broad international sympathy despite scant evidence of any real change in Soviet behavior abroad. Remarkably, despite frequent boasting of American and European communists that they were the most principled anti-fascist opponents of Nazi Germany, it was not until more than two years after Hitler's ascension to power that Stalin finally jettisoned the common turns class against class doctrine, which had been imposed in 1928, and instructed communists everywhere to impugn socialists as social fascists, more dangerous than real fascists like Hitler and Mussolini. <laughs> I mean, we've seen this play out before in left-wing spats, right? Oh, they absolutely. Call each other, they call each other fascist for being insufficiently left-wing. I mean, this is, this is just literally the same The same game plays out over and over again. Yeah, I mean, it, it's Saturn devouring his son. You know, it's the communist devouring the socialist because he's got a, a slightly different opinion on class struggle. So you're, you're lumped in with the fascist. And I mean, this has been the case, literally, like he's saying, since the 19, you know, the 1930s. And uh, yeah, nothing, nothing's really changed. So uh, to, to, to a large extent, right, the, the word fascism has lost all meaning if little tankies on Twitter are going to call other tankies fascists for saying maybe we, maybe we, uh, you know, maybe we don't go total commie retardation, but you know, the cycle repeats itself. Nonetheless, when Stalin finally did change the doctrine at the 7th Comintern Congress held in Moscow in July and August 1935, the impact was dramatic. The new Popular Front strategy enabled socialists and communists to cobble together winning anti-fascist electoral coalitions in France and Spain in 1936, which brought Moscow loyal Communist Party members into the cabinets of both countries for the first time ever. The new doctrine proved a political goldmine for Stalin. In the United States, the dubious idea that Stalin's anti-fascist USSR was the most principled opponent of Hitler's Germany seduced thousands into joining the movement, whether as sympathizers who might attend a few meetings or as paid informants. I'm going to read that footnote here. Oh, C. McMeekin, Red Millionaire, Chapter 3. Well, there you go. Uh, he's got another book on, you know, communist informants. Uh, even for those in the political mainstream, such as President Roosevelt himself, it was hard not to see the Soviet Union as a likable protagonist once Hitler started throwing its weight around Europe. Although the president's hands were tied, owing to a strong congressional and public opposition from deepening strategic ties with Moscow, Roosevelt did everything he could to improve relations with Stalin. In November 1936, he appointed a Soviet sympathizer, Joseph Davies, as his ambassador to Moscow, after Bullitt had become too openly critical of Stalin. Davies warmed U.S.-Soviet relations during the Popular Front era, largely because he stopped criticizing Stalin's policies, whether out of ideological sympathy for communism or, as some critics suspected, because of the favored access Stalin gave Davies' breakfast cereal heiress wife, Marjorie Merriweather Post. Yes, that Post family. To looted Russian artwork she acquired in Moscow at steep discounts. These paintings now grace the walls of the Hillwood Museum in Washington, D.C. Now, stop, because I want to read that source citation. It, it's very yeah. quick. Uh, I'll be quick here. So, and mostly this is for our friends who are more into the art scene. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of Mr. D here, because I'm sure he would he would want to know. Um, so he references Anne Odom, The Selling of Russian Art and the Origins of the Hillwood Collection, in A Taste for Splendor, Russian Imperial and European Treasures from the Hillwood Museum, page 45. So if you would like to reference that, Mr. D, uh, by all means, check it out. Yes, or to anyone else who is interested in the great plundering of, of Russian artwork and treasure during the, the communist period. 
So we'll go back up. Uh, it is worth pausing here to examine the views that cost Bullet his position as ambassador. Whereas Roosevelt wanted to believe that the shift in the common turn doctrine and the opening of Soviet talks of the anti-German alliance with France signaled a genuine desire on Stalin's part for reconciliation with the capitalist world, Bullet reported in July 1935 when the Popular Front was being announced that contrary to the comforting belief which the French now cherish, it is my conviction that there has been no decrease in the determination of the Soviet government to produce world revolution. In quote. Bullet based this conclusion on the fact that every single Soviet and common turn official that he had spoken to had, quote, expressed his belief in the necessity of world revolution, end quote. For this reason, Stalin diplomatic overture towards friendly states, such as in the current instance France, were, in Bullet's view, a mere tactical policy akin to armistice relations, a temporary ceasefire in the battle between communism and capitalism. As for the prospect of a new European war, Bullet did not doubt that the current Soviet policy was, quote, peaceful, but this was only because Stalin had not yet completed his armament drive. It is the primary object of the Soviet Foreign Office, Bullet concluded, to maintain peace until the strength of the Soviet Union has been built up to such a point that it is entirely impregnable to attack and ready should Stalin desire to intervene abroad. Um, Bullet and Kennan remained probably some of the most well-spoken voices on this issue. And it's kind of funny because Kennan was meant to be the ambassador to Moscow and he gets kicked out because he says that the, the Soviets are too much like Nazis and how they like kept uh, treating him and parading him around. And so uh, the, the Soviets were like, well, you can't compare us to Hitler. We're, we got to kick you. <laughs> we got to kick you out. So <laughs> he never really held on to that title for long. Yeah, but you can see that, again, Bullet is a, a guy whose feet are planted on the ground firmly in Moscow, and he's hearing exactly what the apparatchiks are saying. Like these are totally ideologically driven people. They're they're literally telling you what they want, and and as we mentioned in part one, with all of the ideological documentation uh, and Lenin and Stalin, all these documents that you know were pre-revolution, that was what their goal was the entire time. That never changed at any point. Right. And Bullet understands this, and I'm sure Kennan does as well. So really, Roosevelt, as we mentioned before, just doesn't get it. He just doesn't understand that you cannot deal with these people. You can't trade with them. You can't give them anything that they want because they're going to screw you over in order to help the revolution. That's literally it. He, anyway. No, I mean, like, this is such an important thing that I think just doesn't get flushed out enough is, is that... You know, if you if you take and replace a religion, you're going to implement something else for it. And again, the question becomes how many true believers there are. But if your policy is to establish a dominion, to establish an empire, to establish sort of this world class style revolution across the board and see this, you know, fantastical eschatological end of capitalism or class struggle, that's as much of a religious fervor. And I think today, as we see with these tankies and with these sort of commie LARPers on Twitter, or even social Democrats, that that's that's their end goal. That's their religious belief. To, to see that accomplished would be, you know, this sort of eschatological heaven on earth type deal. And so, yeah, you, re you replace and you kill all the priests, you, you, you know, you sack the church for its wealth and its gold, then lo and behold, you have something that's just as powerful. And FDR, as you had said, just either doesn't get it or understands the realities that, hey, I have to work with this guy on the world stage. Um, that, you know, yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a mix of real, real politik, but also I think as McMeekin has illustrated in this section and this chapter and these previous sections for this chapter, that there was so much naivete and just an un, mm -hmm. to the extent of not knowing how much his own government, his own academy, his own industry as a nation had been penetrated and infiltrated really does say how how bad we had it both in world war ii in terms of like what the soviets already knew but also how bad it was and during the cold war and all of this was set up years before the united states was attacked in pearl harbor yep yep uh where Ambassador Bullet had been had seen deception and guile in Stalin's foreign policy, his successor saw unicorns. In a typical Kremlin encounter in June 1938, Joseph Davies fawned over Stalin with compliments. You are a great you are a greater leader than Catherine the Great, than Peter the Great, a greater leader even than Lenin. 
informed him that I know you are a man of peace and offered to share <laughs> sensitive. <laughs> I Sorry. have no words. I have just no words. <laughs> just oh, the the level. This guy's a toady. He's the, the an stick of fancy, you know. Toady. Oh my god. <laughs> just in, like, hey god. man, you got you got some shit all over your nose. <laughs> yeah, brown shit. Yeah. Um, and offered to share sensitive intelligence about American naval deployments in the Pacific, inviting Stalin to intervene in U.S. politics. Davies warned the Vost that although Roosevelt was favorably disposed toward him in the Soviet Union more generally, the president was surrounded by, quote, reactionary elements in Washington who would, Davies hoped, be sidelined. Davies what, took the what reactionary elements? What reactionary elements? Like, we already went through in the first part all of the subversion that was going on, the absolute infestation of people in Roosevelt's cabinet and his administration that were just open commies and fellow travelers. What reactionaries? Like, you don't have that many people in in high places who are uh, totally antithetical towards communism and who actually understand the game that's being played here. Like, you just don't. So, like, this is just an absolutely ridiculous statement. Well, I mean, we also have to consider if he's a fellow traveler, anything that is a quote unquote reactionary element is going to be seen right. as anything not to his left. But yeah. additionally, social, you know, social we, Democrats are reactionaries. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure. But I mean, also that you have to consider that there were business interests that were against this and that you did have popular captains of industry that were adamantly opposed uh, to a point where even FDR talking about taxes, there's a there's a very famous one, I think, where he's going after J.P. Morgan, where he threatens to change the tax rate to a point where it really only affects J.P. Morgan uh, to sort of play ball. Uh, I'm, this, again, is an anecdotal story. I, I could be misremembering who. But, you know, the fact that FDR was willing to play ball, so to speak, like there were business elements. There were, of course, uh, political elements that didn't want to be involved in the war. You did have proto-fascist, you know, sympathy. You had Nazi sympathy in the United States. You know, there were elements that was not happy with FDR, not to mention what was left of the old right, um, basically detailing that, hey, the this FDR guy has brought the revolution that all these, you know, conservatives were really worried about. Um and I, th I think that that's also important to consider. It's not just uh, is, is pure, like, oh, blue team won everything. Um, it, there's there's more to it. Yeah, they definitely had the advantage, though. That's the major point, is, is, of course, these people always have advantages and cards on their side. And they always think, no, I'm. this is the problem with leftism and, and thinking that they're oppressed, is, no, I don't have enough. I never have enough. I never have enough to be able to work with and to accomplish my goals, because of course, it's never enough. You have to have overwhelming resource superiority to make their plans work. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on here. Um, but Davies took the lead for Stalin, urging the president to clean house in the State Department. Roosevelt had been suspicious of the Division for Eastern European Affairs ever since its head, Robert F. Kelly, had written a long memoranda opposing the recognition of the USSR back in 1933. Whereas the Western European division was marked by the dilettantism of American well-born diplomatic establishment, Kelly's division conducted actual research. Budding Soviet experts such as Loy Henderson, Ray Atherton, Charles Chip Bolin, and George Kennan, all of whom served tours of duty in Moscow, had put together what Henderson proudly called the best Soviet library in the United States. All four of these guys were probably the most well-read on Russian history, intelligence, and culture uh, in the country. And this is just, you have, yet again, an example of the people who are on the ground, who are subject matter expert, who understand what's happening, because they've actually read things, uh, and they've, you know, uh, they have source documents, primary sources readily available to them, they've collected them, they've read them, they've collated them, they've stored them, they have access to everything, Roosevelt doesn't know anything, he doesn't know any of this information, and he's being fed it, but of course all these guys get you know, booted. Yeah. And I mean, there's a, and I've done a three part series on my channel on George Kennan. If anyone's interested, he's a personal hero of mine and a personal influence um, of what I believe in and how I've, I look at the world. And, you know, there was a point where George Kennan was criticized that George Kennan knows more about Russia and knows jack shit about America. 
Uh, cause he knew that much. I mean, he, he was a huge, he was a lover of Anton Chekhov. He knew Russian plays. He understood Russian spirituality. He read these things. And so, I mean, this was the kind of guy that would carry around, uh, like in a, you know, he, he could quote the, the, the rise and decline of the, the decline and fall of the Roman empire by Gibbons, uh, like by memory to sort of impress his, his, uh, you know, higher ups. So, I mean, you, you had, basically the the autistic white smart guy that knew what he was doing and kenan doesn't come from i i know kenan better than i do the the other three but you know he he came from milwaukee wisconsin you know middle of nowhere back in the 1900s and so when he becomes part of the foreign service in, in 1926 after getting an ivy league education you know he's not he's not a good old boy he's not here to play the game he's here to do work uh and he is still one of the most premier foreign service officers that anyone uh, who works in foreign service should should look to. Unhappy with the diligent reporting of these experts on the Moscow show trials and the Great Terror, which sat awkwardly with Davies' courtship with Stalin, uh, Roosevelt had his trusted Undersecretary of State, Sumner Wells, a school friend who had attended Groton and Harvard with the president, conduct a thorough purge in 1937. The Eastern European Affairs Division was subordinated into the West European Division, and Kelly was shipped off to Turkey. Even though the division's library, which contained incomparable material on Soviet history and government, including editions of Pravda and the other documentation I'm not going to try to pronounce, is a Vistia. Is Vestia. Yeah, is is Vestia. Vestia. Going all the way back to the Russian Revolution was dismantled, an act of virtual book burning that did away with two decades worth of institutional knowledge of affairs, of, of Soviet affairs in Washington. Oh. Hmm. Unbelievable. How, how interesting. How that, convenient. You know, yeah, how how interesting that there's a liberal purge and book burning. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, to, to read more, Martin Vile, a pretty good club, the founding fathers of the U.S. Foreign Service, pages ninety-two to ninety-three. What a what an, an insane footnote. The the two leading like you know editions of like you know Soviet propaganda and papers burned or basically just done away with. Not phys I don't know if they were physically, but virtu virtually virtually yeah, burned. Through Throwing, throwing something in the garbage is, or like burying it in the backyard to get rid of it is the same thing as burning it. Especially if you're talking about like paper newspapers that don't have a binding, you know, those, yeah. those aren't going to last long in, in inferior, you know, conditions where they can't be preserved. So yeah, it's not hard to get rid of these things. No. And it's crazy to think what might have been lost uh, that we don't have access to anymore today. It's a miracle that we have books that just tell us, hey, we burned these things or got rid of them. Uh, let's see here. In Britain, despite the suspicious bullet-esque posture towards the USSR of the conservative-led governments of Stanley Baldwin and Neville Chamberlain, U.S. Ambassador Davies denounced the latter to Stalin as reactionary. Popular front-style agitprop still provided fertile ground for the recruitment of Soviet spies. The most famous were the Cambridge Five, Anthony Blunt, Guy Burgess, John uh, Carncross, Kim Philby, and Donald McLean. Another Cambridge man, James Klugman, was the head of the British Communist Party's propaganda and education department, and in effect, Stalin's recruiter in chief at Cambridge and Oxford universities. Modern Klugman. research, yeah, uh, again, the 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 top uh, largest, you know, the most prestigious, maybe outside of Eton, right? But the two most prestigious, well-known colleges in in Britain, uh, just a, a recruiting hub for communists. Uh, a modern research has established that Cam the Cambridge Five numbered nine at least. These elites, accompanied by less glamorous recruits, infiltrated the top ranks of the British government and media establishment, including the Foreign Office, Donald MacLean, the Secret Service Intelligence, or MI6, Kim Philby and uh, Guy Burgess, the BBC, Burgess again, the British Army Intelligence, James Klugman, and an Oxford recruit, Tom Wiley, codenamed Max, supplied classified information from the War Office to Burgess and Philby. By the decades in, as MI6 historian Christopher Andrew writes, quote, the volume of high-grade intelligence these men supplied was to become so large that Moscow sometimes had difficulty coping with it, end quote. In a typical year, more than 9,000 classified British government documents were passed on to Moscow. So just think of how, how deep this infiltration is, right? This is, like, what is the even the point of having you know, code breakers, uh, you know, the people who, you know, made a computer basically to break the German codes. What, what, what do you don't even need that if you have this many high level people 
who are just simply saying, here you go, Stalin, here's all these, this documentation. You have everything. You know what we're going to do. You know when we're going to do it. You know how we're going to do it. You know everything. You know the names of the people involved. You know the institutions, the agencies, best practices. Um, like w when you want to talk about any sort of military intelligence or, or government um, reports or that sort of thing, that usually gets classified. What you're more likely to see gets classified is, is not just, oh, we can do something. It's how we're going to do it when we're going to do it, why we're going to do it this way, and all of the methodology that goes into that. So when you're seeing all of this stuff, right, and that's a lot of documentation, right? And of course, 9,000 might be bureaucratic notes and paper slips and that sort of thing, which might be a lot of banal stuff. But that stuff actually does matter because if you can have the detail and if you have another document which tells you, okay, we're doing this, the reason why somebody's doing something might be contained in the detail. Like this is just basic, basic intelligence collection. And of course, as everybody knows from the Soviet Union, uh, they're not incompetent at data and intelligence collection. Absolutely. And I mean, and this sort of goes back to it's more of an anecdotal story, but I mean, anyone who grew up on a, on a military base or had AFN, you're going to hear all these commercials about OPSEC and, you know, all these guys telling you that like the Soviets had so much data and, and spies and intelligence on us that they would have won this, the cold war if it ever went hot. And I mean, you, you know, I, it just, it also sort of, it, it begs and it raises the question that there's so much focus on the, uh, you know, on like cracking the Enigma code and, and such, but, uh, no information on this uh, at all, you know, outside of texts that are specifically focused on Soviet infiltration. But to know that at any point in time, you know, sure, the, the Nazis didn't have, you know, our intelligence, but, you know, Moscow did. And it's not like we would have ever gone to war with them anyways. But still, it illustrates just how compromised uh, both the American and British government were. So let's carry on. The diplomatic catchword after 1935 was collective security. The idea, assiduously promoted by Maxim Litvinov, was swallowed uncritically by apologists like Joseph Davies that the USSR must be an essential part of any coalition to contain Hitler. France, the country that most directly threatened by Hitler's rearmament campaign, fell hardest for Stalin's propaganda. Despite skepticism in the French high command about the value of a military alliance with Stalin, French diplomats negotiated a Franco-Soviet pact of mutual assistance even before the election of a popular front government in June 1936. A draft was signed as early as May 1935 and ratified by the French Parliament in February 1936. In the case of the threat or danger of aggression on the part of a European state, the pact stated with Germany in mind, France and the USSR would proceed an immediate mutual consultation and lend each other reciprocal aid and assistance. The repercussions of the Franco-Soviet pact were serious, though unintended. The agreement bore resemblance to the Franco-Russian alliance of 1894, which had confirmed the division of Europe into two hostile military blocs and lent credence to German fears of encirclement. Still, the agreement of 1894, however, dangerous in its provocation of Germany, had real teeth. France and Russia had committed themselves to mobilize simultaneously in case of war and with tight coordination. In theory, this could have deterred the Germans, even if, in practice in 1914, it did not. And he's got a great talk on this on the, the World War I Museum. I talked about this in the last video, but go listen to McMeekin's discussion on the, the Franco-Russian alliance uh, in the lead-up to World War I, especially in July 1914. It's a fantastic discussion. Uh, the Franco-Soviet pact brought with it all the sorry diplomatic consequences of the earlier one, confirming Hitler's complaints about the unjustness of the Versailles system while containing no binding military clauses whatsoever. It was all provocation and no deterrence, as Hitler showed within days of its ratification on March 7, 1936, citing the Franco-Soviet pact as pretext, he ordered German troops to march into the Rhineland, overturning that region's demilitarization mandated by the Versailles Treaty, and nothing happened. If you're if you're gonna do defense packs, kids, and this is a lesson about, I guess, to a large extent, NATO as well, you have to you have to be willing to commit, and that also leads to the issue of the alliance trap, which we saw in World War One, and we've been worried about in the escalation with Ukraine and Russia, but um, potentially there are talks that may bring that conflict to an end. As tragic as all of that is, but that's a discussion for another time. 
In defense of France's beleaguered diplomats, there was good reason the Franco-Soviet pact had been left militarily toothless. If the Quad d'Orsay had signed a genuine military accord with Stalin, this would have complicated France's defense agreements with Hitler's eastern neighbors. True, Czechoslovakia had signed its own equally toothless mutual defense pact or de defense or mutual assistance pact with the USSR in May 1935, but there were reasons to doubt that the Czechs truly wanted to invite the Red Army to deter German aggression that the Soviets would be able to get there if Prague asked. Because the USSR shared no land borders with Czechoslovakia or Germany, any military cooperation with France or Czechoslovakia against Hitler, as the French general staff observed in 1936, would require the Red Army to transit Poland and Romania, two countries that had active border disputes with Soviet Russia. Poland, at the time, had more reason to fear the USSR than Germany, as shown in the non-aggression pact it had signed with Hitler in 1934. As for the French General Staff report, noted ruefully, our military alliance with Poland, which dated to 1921, would appear to be incompatible with a Russian military alliance. One must choose between them. By refusing to make a clear choice between Poland and Stalin's Russia, France simultaneously provoked German aggression and estranged key allies in Eastern Europe. By affixing a seal of approval to Stalin's totalitarian regime, the Franco-Soviet pact had also alarmed the conservative-led government of France's ally Great Britain. For these reasons, the French general staff hated the Franco-Soviet pact, but was forced to swallow it anyway. Well, there, was... there you have Go it. Ahead. That's just a very uncontrolled diplomatic corps who's just going to ride roughshod over any of the preferences of you know, the lion elite in, in France at the time. So the foxes are just totally ignoring anything that the lions want to do. And, and the point of all of this is basically Stalin is looking westward for an ally which he can use against hitler and he, of course he he gets a this non-aggression pact right or this mutual assistance pact but he he doesn't have a military alliance yet and so this is like a, a, a first try basically this is not how i think about this is he he's looking for one he hasn't gotten one but the idea has already been implanted that a western country needs to ally with the Soviet Union against Hitler. So again, you know, tri you know, NRX triangle and all of that, you had one side of the triangle and the other side of the triangle ganging up on, on the more reactionary per or perceived reactionary triangle. But anyway. Yeah. I mean, then again, th this illustrates that, you know, oh, well, what, what, what matters more? What, what's a matter of convenience? I mean, to, to the French, obviously, there is the concern that the Soviets are larger and, and military personnel or a larger power to be slung around with. Uh, it would be beneficial. Plus, there's history there with the previous regime. But it also comes to the great cost of sacrificing uh, any relationship to Eastern Europe. Although in the long run, as we see how the Second World War plays out, this is all basically useless anyway, as France... Uh, quickly falls to uh, German advances and surrenders, or at least partially. Uh, there was this. W there was clearly an element of buyer's remorse on the French side, as Pierre Laval, the slippery statesman responsible for negotiating the pact, confessed to Soviet diplomats in July 1936 that he had been basically alone in the French government favoring a genuine Soviet alliance. The ratification of the pact, which Moscow had hoped that France would sign in summer 1935 to publicize the Popular Front, was delayed for months. There was even ominous signs picked up by Soviet intelligence that Laval, a later Vichy collaborator, was meeting regularly with Hitler's right-hand man, Hermann Göring, while the Franco-Soviet pact was still on hold in the French Senate. Soviet diplomats had genuine grounds for doubting French good faith. And we should all have doubts you know, for, for any genuine faith out of the Soviets. But yeah, here's here's Europe in 1936. Um, the Rhineland is reinstated by Hitler in 1936. Uh, so yeah, you've, you've got the Soviet Union. Um, you've got, of course, the ongoing issue over uh, territorial disputes with Poland. Um, and so that makes it all but impossible to, to maintain a relationship with them, France and Soviet Union. Uh, but these are, these are your borders. Uh, that, that will soon change, and look at look at all these British and French pr and Italian protectorates, uh, 1936, and uh, how that still plays a role even to this day. 
Compounded by the failure of the West to stand up to Hitler when he remilitarized the Rhineland, France's reluctance to enter into a real military alliance with the Soviet Union played into Stalin's pose as the only counterweight to Hitler in Europe. Litvinov, who was Jewish, was perfectly was the perfect frontman for Stalin's charm counteroffensive, talking up the collective security in every capital he visited. Abused in Nazi anti-Semitic screeds as Finkelstein, Litvinov was recognized in the West as a sincere principal opponent of Hitler. After Hitler absorbed Austria into the German Reich in the Anschluss of March 1938, Litvinov issued a public statement demanding that the great powers take a firm and unambiguous stand. This is exactly where those in powers famously failed to do so in Munich in September 1938, when Neville Chamberlain leaned on French pure, uh, Premier Edouard Daladier to appease Hitler by offering him the Czech Sudetenland. Litvinov, uninvited to Munich, could only fume from the sidelines. Cope and seethe. Well, if you're not invited, that's really all you can do. <laughs> Genuine as Litvinov's hatred of Hitler may have been, there are good reasons to doubt Stalin's sincerity about collective security. In the short course, a kind of Bible of communism published in 1938, as the Czechoslovakia crisis was breaking, the term collective security does not appear. Stalin instead spoke of a new period in Europe, uh, in the European and world affairs, declaring that the so Second Imperialist War has actually begun and the loose mutual assistance pacts of Litvinov had signed with Czechoslovakia and France, as more perceptive ambassadors like Bullet had intuited, entailed no genuine Soviet obligation to defend these countries against aggression by declaring war on Germany. Litvinov himself stated plainly to the Director General of the Czechoslovak Foreign Office, Arnost Heydrich, shortly before the Munich Conference of 1938, that, quote, Soviet Russia would not repeat the mistake of Tsarist Russia in 1914. We know that the Western powers would like to have Hitler liquidated by Stalin and Stalin by Hitler, but in that they will not succeed. While in 1914 to 1917, the Western powers sparing their forces watched the bloody struggle between Russia and Germany, this time we shall observe the contest between Germany and the Western powers and shall not intervene in the conflict until we ourselves feel it fit to do so in order to bring about the decision. Basically, you, Britain, France, y'all fight it out this time. We, we have learned the lesson of the alliance trap. We're not doing this again. And they're not going to get themselves into a bloody war that could threaten their regime's stability. But uh, Litvinov here, being very tactful, just states it out quite clearly. If you want to get in this war, so be it. We're not repeating what we did last time. Of course, that would change come Barbarossa and even earlier, but still. Despite the public fanfare, Soviet foreign policy had not magically changed in 1935 from the fanatical hostility towards the capitalist world to principal cooperation based on the shared antipathy toward Hitler. Nor did the USSR stand in any way alongside Britain, France, and France's Eastern European partners against territorial revisionism as the Czechoslovaks had convinced themselves when they signed a pact with Moscow in 1935. The Soviet Union had been born in armed hostility to the Entente powers after World War I and had lost huge swaths of formerly Russian land, from the newly independent Finland and the Baltic states to former Ukrainian and Belarusian territory that was now eastern Poland to Romanian Bessarabia along the Black Sea littoral. The USSR was just as revisionist as Italy and Nazi Germany in seeking to overturn the post-war settlement. Um, and revisionist, we don't just mean revisionist in terms of revision histori in, in revisionist historians, but revisionist in the international relations sense of the word. Uh, you have hegemonic states and revisionist states. And in the terms of the 1930s, you know, uh, Italy, Germany, and the USSR were revisionist states against the reigning rules-based hegemonic order of sort of the um, entente, the, the allied powers of the First World War and the Versailles, you know, uh, order that had been established. So for now, of course, Stalin was artfully concealing his own territorial ambitions. Stalin provided clues about these ambitions in 1937 and 1938, although few Western diplomats were paying close attention. In May 1937, Litvinov was quietly removed from the European desk in the Soviet Foreign Ministry and replaced by Vice Commissar of Foreign Affairs, V.P. Potepkin, even while Litvinov remained Foreign Affairs Commissar, that is, frontman that's the potemkin you're thinking about by the way yes, uh it is that is that is what what the potemkin village is named after this gentleman here <laughs> hmm. yeah but we'll, we'll we'll carry on um 
Let's see here. In February 1938, uh, Potemkin hinted at the Bulgarian minister in Moscow that Stalin might be interested in a partition of Poland. In April 1938, Potemkin wrote ominously in a Soviet theoretical journal, Bolshevik, that Hitler aims to let Poland loose against the Soviet Union. Let the Polish army be shattered. Let Poland again, as in 1920, begin to tremble under the hooves of the Soviet columns. Hitler is preparing Poland's fourth partition. Let history be repeated. So blatant were Potemkin's hints about dismembering Poland in tandem with Germany that they reached the French ambassador in Moscow, Robert Collant, in October 1938. In the next month, in the mouthpiece of the Kremlin's uh, Izvestia, I can't pronounce this, it's going to kill me. Izvestia. 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 Thank you. I know more Greek than I do Russian. Uh, openly mooted the idea of partitioning Poland in the northeast section joining Soviet Belarusia, eastern Galicia being annexed to Soviet Ukraine, and the area of western um, Vistula or Weichstel being assigned to Germany. Um, and eastern Galicia and, uh, you know, Ukraine and Belarusia still to these days are, are issues of territorial revisionism. Stalin had dropped another hint about his revisionist foreign policy aims in April 1938 between the Anschluss and Munich, where he had sent a special envoy, Boris Yartsev, to Helsinki without Litvinov's knowledge to demand the right to build Soviet military bases on Finnish territory. After Yartsev was rebuffed, Stalin sent an NKVD officer to Helsinki to demand 30-year Soviet leases of the island of Sursari and four smaller islets in the Gulf of Finland. The only difference between this and Hitler's moves in Austria and Czechoslovakia that year was that Stalin's Finnish gambit failed. Pushing neighbors around and dropping hints about partitioning Poland was a far cry from, quote, collective security. Yeah, no kidding, right? I mean, you're yeah. claiming, oh, we need to be all together against Hitler bros. Be all, please, bro, let's all fight Hitler, bro. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then you're talking about partitioning Poland with Hitler and then invading finland yeah of course absolutely i mean again this is this is the the problem with the revisionist international relations or foreign policy is just that if you're you got to stay on message you got to stay on message. i mean that's the key part of any diplomacy that's that's why i always laugh when like mearsheimer was like confronting michael mccall and he's just like of course we lie like everybody lies but you know you got to make sure you don't get caught in that lie <laughs> But uh, I just, again, uh, this is important pieces of history to, to consider, but let's carry on. The ultimate aim of Soviet foreign policy, the weakening of capitalist regimes by any means necessary, and the con, uh, committant global expansion of communism remained the same. War between Hitler and the Western democracies might break out over Hitler's claims on the Czech Sudetenland, or it might not. In either case, it was best not to intervene militarily until it served Soviet interests to do so. As Stalin privately told his military intelligence chief, quote, there are immediate enemies and potential enemies. And the Czechs were at the time, the enemies of our enemies, nothing more, end quote. Far from fearing that the Sudetenland crisis would lead to a European war, Stalin was disappointed by in, that the Western betrayal at, at Munich on September 30th deprived him of a pretty little war which others would fight. As the German ambassador in Moscow, Count Friedrich Werner von de Schulenburg reported on Berlin on October 3rd, adding that such a war would have brought much joy to Moscow after observing that Poland, too, had exploited Munich to slice off bits of Czech territory. Soviet propagandists crackled in Pravada on October 1st that, quote, the Poles are digging a grave for Poland's independence, end quote. This, this is such an interesting little um, section here because the narrative that we are fed in our modern historiography of this time period, especially 1938 after the Munich Agreement and, and the Sudetenland cr and, uh, crisis, is basically Poland is totally innocent of any wrongdoing. Poland did nothing wrong. And here, even Poland is like taking bits of, of Czechoslovak territory. And the problem with Czechoslovakia, like with everything else, is... You know, it, it's a multi-ethnic state that really is created by diktat uh, post-World War One, And it, it's just a state that didn't make any sense at all um, because it's just it's an ethnic mishmash. It has no natural borders that you can make with it that conform to those ethnic groups. So, of course, this was always going to lead to a crisis, as we see 
time and time again in in foreign policy. It it, it just you know, and of course, I'm sure that this little bit of Czech territory, it's not very large at all. I, I, I've seen it. Um, it's very small compared to the Sudetenland even. But basically, I'm. you probably had ethnic Poles who were in that region or living in that region in majority. And so, oh, well, this is our territory. So we're going to take that now since we're just you know carving up Czechoslovakia. But anyway. Yeah, I mean, they're... You're you're to take advantage of international chaos and in, in, in seize territory where you can. Stalin's purging of the Soviet armed forces in 1937-1938 had seriously hampered Soviet military credibility in the short run, whatever his intentions were at the time of Munich. Although the Communist Party and secret police had been targeted soon after the Kirov murder in December 1934, it was the spectacular downfall of M. N. Chukovsky, the Russian Civil War hero and Marshal of the Soviet Union, after the May Day Parade in 1937 that truly marked the onset of Stalin's Great Terror. Tukhachevsky, a dashing ex-nobleman officer resented by Stalin ever since the two had crossed swords in the, Soviet, or in the Polish-Soviet War of August 1920, was the perfect foil for jealous rivals such as the Communist Party hack Klement Klim Voroshilov, a crony of Stalin's who had teamed up with him to do away with the ex-Tsarist officers appointed by Trotsky at Tsaristian, the future Stalingrad, in 1918. In November 1938, Voroshilov boasted that he had personally purged 40,000 Soviet officers, including three of the five field marshals, 15 of the 16 field army commanders, 60 of the 67 corps commanders, and thousands of lower-ranking officers. Meanwhile, he had promoted nearly 100,000 new men to replace them. During this time of violent churn in the officer corps, the USSR was hardly ready to fight a major European war. Despite all of Litvinov's talk of collective security, the refusal of Western powers to invite him to Munich shows that responsible statesmen had a more realistic appraisal of the Soviet war readiness and the real nature of Stalin's foreign policy. I mean, that's an incredible, incredible Here number of officers. Like, I mean... And they're not lower ranking officers, these people, like 15 of 16 army field commanders, 60 of 67 corps commanders, and of course, Tukhachevsky himself, which if, if you're anybody's familiar with Tukhachevsky, um, he is, even in um, the early days of the Soviet Union, he's one of their best marshals. Like, I think he's the, the first marshal of the Soviet Union, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but anyway, he's... He's their best guy. He's their best military commander of the Red Army. And Stalin gets rid of this guy um, two years before, well, well, uh, two or three years before the actual war between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany takes place. So, I mean, you know, leadership is so much of war. And to get rid of all of this stuff, all of these guys in incredibly critical positions, well, it, it just... It makes you think that, well, maybe the Soviet Union actually, uh, there was a reason for its poor performance in, in Barbarossa. You know, maybe it wasn't just, uh, um, maybe it, the Red Army wasn't as unstoppable as a juggernaut as everybody perceived it to be. Yeah, and I've got the footnote up there on screen. And I mean, he was, um, you know, him and Voroshilov and... Um, Alexander Yegorovov and others were all listed as, um, you know, field uh, marshals of the Soviet Union in, in 1935. Of course, he would be stripped of, of rank famously in 1937 in these purges. But not everyone agrees on the purges impact of the Soviet army uh, army's effectiveness. The Czechoslovaks reckoned that the Soviet striking power remained fully intact in 38. Polish experts thought the Red Army army had been irreparably weakened. The French agreed more with the Polish estimate. See French ambassador in Moscow, Robert Kolondra, the foreign minister, George's bonnet, April 19, uh, April 26, 1938. Um, and there are plenty of different um, estimates and that you can look at uh, on these texts. Not all of the purged officers were executed and 11,000, 11,500 were later reinstatement. Nonetheless, the effect on morale was, uh, was surely negative immediately. I mean, obviously the morale question, but it's also a competency question. So he's, uh, this Voroshilov is pr uh, boasting that he purged 40,000 and you reinstate 11,500. So out of that many people, right, you're reinstating 
Uh, and of course, we don't know the timing for re for reinstatement, right? Is that six months into Barbarossa when Stalin is on the back foot and is like, shit, 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 I need to, I need to get, get me competent people who actually understand how to fight, you know? Um, or is that, you know, a year afterwards? Uh, something tells me that the timing on that is probably when he's on the back foot in, in Barbarossa and he needs competent people. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So this gives us a, a chance to continue. We can get a better idea of genuine rather than professed Soviet foreign policy priorities from Stalin's actions in the two armed conflicts of the Popular Front era, the Spanish Civil War and the Sino-Japanese War, which erupted in 1937. On the surface, the advent of the Popular Front government in Madrid in February 1936 offered a proving ground for Soviet anti-fascism after General Francisco Franco's nationalist forces rebelled in July 1936. But the guiding principle of Stalin's intervention in Spain, historians discovered after the opening of the Soviet archives, was not so much anti-fascism, but as opportunism. The Madrid government possessed in 1936 the fourth largest gold reserve in the world. Unlike Hitler and Mussolini, who allowed Franco to purchase arms on credit, thus giving them a vested interest in him winning the war so that they could recoup repayment, Stalin insisted payment up front. By the end of 1936, Stalin had secured 518 million in Spanish gold, or 463 tons of bullion. In exchange, the Soviets sent Spain 320 warplanes, 350 tanks, 1,900 guns, 15,000 machine guns, 500,000 rifles, 250 grenade launchers, and ammunition. Uh, so, pay up front. Yeah, Ima exactly. ima Imagine if we operated on gold and Zelensky was asking for payment up front. <laughs> exactly. Well, we, yeah, if we were asking for Zelensky for payment up front, God, I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, yeah, but as I said before in, in part one, uh, Stalin needs gold for a very particular reason, because if you don't actually have a currency, uh, you can't trade internationally, and the only thing that you can trade for internationally and purchase things that you need is if you have gold because gold ironically is what real money is um so i mean 518 million I mean, that's ridiculous um but and of course just thinking in terms of the last stream what in terms and the amount of things that stalin is purchasing abroad uh, and and being able to finance his rearmament drive, this is in, an incredibly important um, thing to acquire uh, because he's still doing that at the same time as this is going on, right? It's not like he's not building more tanks, building more planes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, but, this number this number really does speak to Soviet industrial capabilities in the 1930s. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he's, these are all like the 500,000 rifles. I'm sure he's, the, the Soviets have, you know, a few million ex czarist Mosin Nagants that are lying around from the First World War. And I'm sure that makes this number easier to, to part with. Um, but that's a substantial amount of weaponry to give. Like, that's not nothing, right? Considering that, the, if I remember correctly, the Spanish Civil War's total casualties were about 500,000. Um, for both sides combined. Um, very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Mm. But yeah, I mean, that's just an insane number to think about. I mean, of course, that will be dwarfed by World War II, obviously, but still, you know, 1936, we're, we're still a few years before the war kicks off for the Soviets, and, you know, this is what you're capable of sending, and still securing the bag, literally. Yeah, it's also in, important, right, because this, and I'm, I'm, we'll get into it with the rest of the Spain stuff, but the, the really, this is when you start to see Stalin uh, change tact a bit, um, and why the Popular Front, and there's a reason why this chapter is named the Popular Front, because the Popular Front is um, the left-wing coalition, which included communists, um, to basically say, we're all going to team up and we're going to fight against the fash. We have already seen that Hitler is, has taken power in Germany. Mussolini is installed in Italy. Franco is now uh, attacking the Republican government of Spain. Um, and really, you can. I'm, other people have done better scholarship than, than uh, me on this, but the you can really tell that the... The reason why Stalin is doing this is because he wants control, 
over over this coalition. That's why he's doing it. He does he doesn't want it because he he is like okay, well, we're not going to cooperate with Nazi Germany, or we're not going to do what's in our interest when it it serves us. No, he wants control over the popular front, basically. Yeah. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll carry on here. Uh, this was not nothing, but it was hardly the kind of all-out commitment Spanish Republican forces might have expected after handing the country's gold reserves to Moscow. Yeah, you thought you might get a little more bang for your buck. The Soviet supplies largely dried up after the first winter uh, war winter of 1936-37. to A better idea of Stalin's real commitment to the Republican cause can be gleaned from sending Madrid only 2,082 Soviet troops and military technician, a mere fraction of the military manpower Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy, 16,000 and 70,000 respectively, devoted to Spain. As the head of the Soviet military mission in Madrid, the former chief of the Soviet army intelligence, Jan Berzin, codenamed Don Zanetti or Starik, meaning old man, complained to Stalin on December 12, 1936, that he did not have enough rifles to equip 12 brigades. He was short of tanks, bombers, fighters, and artillery. I mean, uh, it remi- it, spending wars, right? You know, I, I, this kind of mm-hmm. reminds me of our, our conflict in Ukraine. We've, we've spent billions of dollars and we don't have enough men and... Uh, you know, the, we're up against a numerical advantage. We're up against uh, the m- amount of shells that can be produced. And of course, they don't have the the key equipment. So, in terms of total manpower, because this is a fascinating. Once you start talking about not just in total manpower, but in military organization, if you m- combine the numbers here between Hitler's manpower and Mussolini's manpower contributions, that's about a little under six divisions worth of men. It's like yeah. five and a half divisions. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> that's quite a bit for for foreign aid, right? That's not that's that's an expeditionary force. So yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, the 518 million in gold Stalin wrested from Madrid gave him his pick of promising new aviation technology in France, Germany, Italy, and the United States. The Soviet DD-3 bomber was developed in the multi-million dollar year by the Glenn L. Martin Company of Baltimore. Stalin had also purchased a Soviet license to build both the DC-2 and the DC-3 transport planes from Douglas Aircraft Company for $130,000 and $207,500, respectively. The DC-3 was then uh, redesigned by Boris Pavlovich Lysunov and became the Soviet Li-2 transport. Because of the lack of U.S. government contracts in an era when Congress was reluctant to authorize military spending, some American aviation firms, such as Volte Aircraft of Los Angeles, which specialized in light dive bombers designed for infantry support and ground attack, became positively dependent on Soviet orders. The IL-2 Stronovic, designed by Sergei Ilyushin, was based on the Volte prototypes. One of the most famous Soviet bombers you know, attack craft ever. Yeah. Most famous heavy attack craft from World War II of all time is the yeah. IL-2 Shermovic. And of course, this is based on American, American designs. Tech. Yes. Yes. American pro- pro- blueprints. Yeah. Ah. If you, uh, if you, uh, America. Oh, oh no, baby. What is you doing? Uh, <laughs> but of course, at the same time, the American government wasn't spending uh, a lot of money on the military. Uh, Stalin also ordered a 62,000-ton American aircraft carrier and a number of other capital ships in 1938, although these orders were later blocked, owing U.S. obligations to Britain under the London Naval Treaty, and placed lucrative orders with leading European firms such as Renault, uh, Renault, warplanes and aviation engines, Ratier Figat, uh, aviation propellers, and Hotchkiss for machine guns. It was not that Stalin did not want to hide his, want his side to win the war in Spain. Rather, in exchange for material support, Stalin demanded political control of the government, finding the war a higher priority than military victory. Coinciding with the violent purges in the Soviet Union, Spain furnished Stalin a tableau to expand the Great Terror to Europe. This was an era of the middle of the night knocks on the door by the NKVD brute squads, the death quotas and deportations of suspicious foreigners to Soviet concentration camps. Although the Moscow show trials and the Red Army purges generated the most attention outside of Russia, some nine-tenths of great terror victims were targeted as ethnic minorities, primarily Ukrainians and Poles. The bizarre notion, advanced by Soviet apologists, that a regime undergoing a genocidal paroxysm of xenophobia at home was devoted to international law, the sanctity of borders, and principled collective security abroad has (laughs) has distorted the diplomatic history of this period. 
You no, don't. You, say. you don't say. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> Although that's interesting that the the great terror victims were ethnic minorities like Ukrainians and Poles. He gives us a specific example, but you know it makes you wonder um, because a lot of the Bolshevik strategy of coming to power is a coalition of the fringes or a coalition of the margins, like every left wing coalition, which is a which is a revolutionary coalition uses to gain power. And of course, what happens after they take power is they start betraying the people who brought them there. And uh, so a lot of, you can imagine a lot of Lithuanians and and Poles and, and Ukrainians who might have been pro-Bolshevik uh, got the hatchet, got the ice pick at this time because, no, actually, we're going to, this is the start of, of bio-Stalinism, as our dear friend Jairo Pol calls it. It's, it's the beginning of a rightward turn in terms of uh, Soviet policy, right? You, you've already gotten rid of all of the, or you've, you're in the process of getting rid of all the kooks and the crazies and the freaks who are going to inherently destabilize your regime if you leave them in place and you don't bring in competent people. So there you have it. That's pretty much what's going on. A absolutely. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll carry on here. Likewise, the cause of Republican anti-fascism in Spain, however, was appealing to volunteers from Europe and North America. It is hard to reconcile with Stalin's use of civil war as a killing ground for alleged enemies of the Soviet Union. In May 1937, an NKVD team led by the ruthless Alexander Orlov arrived in Barcelona to carry out a bloody sectarian purge, a searing episode first chronicled by George Orwell in Homage to Catalonia. After sending old man Burson back to Moscow to be ex executed, Starek had complained <laughs> Stalin was not sending enough arms to help the Republicans win the war. Orlov established a tribunal of espionage and high treason in Barcelona, which was soon working at full blast. Orlov's victims included foreign volunteers as well. Uh, like, notably, yeah, I'm, I'm sure, because, of course, it, it doesn't matter if you're a foreign volunteer, you're, a, you're under Soviet le leadership here. And this is the most Soviet joke of soviet jokes right is you know it's your your turn to get the ice pick it comes eventually so you know uh orlov gets the ice pick too i guess <laughs> uh, he was he was indeed the ice pick uh, Soviet-directed purges significantly undermined Republican morale. Even as Stalin's agents tightened the political corkscrew, more Soviet advisors returned home every month. By 1938, the Soviet military presence in Spain had fallen to 250 men and Soviet arms shipments had slowed to a trickle. The fallout was predictable. Franco's forces went from triumph to triumph, reaching the Mediterranean in April 1938 and splitting Republican Spain in two. Stalin responded not by cutting Madrid off, but by recalling 50 more Soviet officers and doling out just enough aid to keep Juan Negrin's government on life support. A cynic might conclude that Stalin's goal in the Spanish Civil War had not been so much winning as it was prolonging the fighting as long as possible. Oh, where have we seen this strategy before? Hmm. Yeah, where, where have we seen this before? In the case of China, we can say this without hesitation. New research of the Soviet archives have unearthed a critical role Stalin played in reigniting the Sino-Japanese War in 1937. Tensions between Japan's Kwantung Army and the Russians in the Far East had eased during the ceasefire years since 1933, despite periodic border incidents and covert Soviet support for anti-Japanese partisans in occupied Manchuria. In March 1935, Stalin even agreed to sell Russia's uh, old Manchurian Railway concession, which dated back to the Tsarist times for 140 million yen. The pause in the fighting on the Japanese front had allowed Chiang Kai-shek nationalists to concentrate their fire on the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, with the Kuomintang's fifth encirclement campaign of September 1933, pushing the communists into their long march, which, through weakening communist forces in the short run, made the reputation of Mao Zedong. In November 1935, Mao was named the new leader of the Communist Chinese Party, now based deep in the interior of Yan. Manchurian, the Manchurian War that had been dominating the headlines in the early 1930s seemed, by 1936, to have devolved into a debilitating Chinese civil war, a war both the Soviets and the Japanese were content to observe from the sidelines. Then Stalin took a hand. On the surface of the Comintern's new Popular Front doctrine offered a, the prospect of an Asian realignment, with Moscow brokering a, choose, a truce between Chiang and Mao to unite China against Japanese aggression. Mao, weaker and more isolated, was willing to parley. 
he wrote to Chiang Kai-shek on August 25th, 1936, proposing an all-Chinese united government of national defense. But Chiang, a former Soviet client who had broken with Stalin in 1927, rejected Mao's olive branch. On December 12, 1936, Chiang, who was arrested or kidnapped by his own officers at Xi'an, Cyan, who held him hostage and opened negotiations with Mao's envoy, Cho Enlai. Names sound familiar, kids? Informed of Chiang Kai-shek's capture, Mao sent a telegram to Moscow rejoicing in the news of the arrest of the mother of all criminals. On December 15th, the CCP requested that the Kuomintang mutineers hand Chiang over to the People's Tribunal, but Stalin insisted after Chiang agreed to release communist prisoners and open a second united front against Japanese Manchuria. An appointed rejoinder to the anti comintern pact signed by Germany and Japan on November 25, 1936, Italy would sign the following year in 37, Stalin's coup ensured, as SCM Payne argues in a new study, that Chinese, not Russian soldiers, would die fighting Japan. Again, why, why, why fight a war if someone else will do it for you? Exactly. Um, but just because uh, you mentioned it earlier, uh, Prude, what is the significance of this uh, man, Zhu Enlai, what it, for our audience members who might be unaware of him? What? Well, I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing the foundation. Uh, this is the backdrop of the, the Chinese civil war between the, the nationalists and the communists. Uh, Mao Zedong, of course, famously the leader of communist China after China, quote unquote, falls in 1949. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Cho Enlai would later be a premier of communist China and would be helpful and responsible for the Americans reopening up American Chinese relations with Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon in the 1970s. So you're seeing these young men who would later be statesmen of their own right later in their uh, elderly years. But these men are in their prime fighting a civil war for the you know, control of China and to wrestle against uh, Japanese um, aggression and, and investigation and uh, occupation of Manchuria. Uh, and during my time in university, I had a very elderly, uh, and I'm, like silent generation professor who was a, a native Japanese who would later immigrate to America after the war. Uh, and he had said, really, Japan's greatest mistake was not exploiting uh, the, the Chinese civil war like the, the Soviets did. Because, you know, and this, of course, was alternate history takes, but he was saying, like, listen, if Japan had really done more to help Chiang Kai-shek, uh, we would probably still occupy Manchuria and there would be no Chinese Communist Party. And I mean, I'm getting like the Japanese kind of like older racism and understanding of the war. He was a little boy when the fire bombings of Tokyo took place, but uh, I've never forgotten that class. And it was literally just the Pacific Theater in World War II. And I got to hear it from a a Japanese perspective of a Japanese national uh, telling his story. And uh, I, I should do a, a whole series maybe on the Pacific theater, but it's just, I, I've never forgotten that him just arguing up and down saying, we could have kept Manchuria. We should have just, you know, accepted peace with the Americans like fuck China. And it was just this very, uh, you know, things to uncouth to hear from an 80 something year old man. <laughs> oh man. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's my he was my favorite professor in college outside of uh, one other gentleman. Um, but if, if this was Stalin's objective in December 1936, he succeeded brilliantly. Japan took the bait, responding to the United Front, which appeared in Japanese eyes to herald a communist takeover of China by invading the Chinese mainland after a bloody skirmish at the Marco Polo Bridge on the outskirts of Beijing on July 7th, 1937. By November, Japan had incurred 40,000 casualties. Not over a little over 9,000 dead, almost 32,000 wounded. Chinese losses were heavier still, amounting to 187,200 in the first four months, including 70% of Chiang Kai-shek's officers. Convenient that the officer corps of the nationalists or the anti-communist side had lost out here. Just as Stalin had hoped, nationalists who did the fighting and dying in Japan, not Mao's communists. Both Mao and Chiang had expected reasonably, though, that the Red Army, 250,000 strong in Mongolia and the Soviet Far East, would intervene after Stalin helped reignite the war. They badly misread Stalin's foreign policy. His aim in opening a Chinese united front was not to waste his own strength fighting Japan, but to preserve it by prolonging the Sino-Japanese War. As Nelson T. Johnson, the U.S. ambassador in China, observed in February 1938, with a far keener grasp of Soviet foreign policy than his gullible counterpart in Moscow, quote, communist Russia expects to profit by the chaos that Japan is creating and see safety for itself in a Japan that is exhausting itself in China, end quote. 
Just as in Spain, Stalin sent just enough arms and supplies to China to keep the war going. These included expendable Soviet-made fighters, heavy guns, machine guns, trucks, and 82 light and medium tanks. But a more substantial commitment to Chiang, let alone outright Soviet military intervention, was not to be. By the time Shanghai fell to Japan in November 1937, Chiang's diplomats in Moscow had grown desperate, demanding that Stalin intervene before it was too late. But the Vost, who had his own sleeper agent in Chiang's camp, Commander General Chang Chichung, saw no cause for desperate measures. On November 18, 1937, Stalin promised to send troops only if the collapse of the Chinese government was imminent. He was That's, good to that, his... That guy has a hilarious name, I'm sorry. Ah... <laughs> uh. Of all, the thing, of all the things we laugh at, it's going to be casual uh, Asiatic racism. Uh, he was good to his word. Whenever nationalist forces were on the run, the Red Army would draw off enough Japanese forces to allow Chiang to recover. Then Stalin would withdraw and let the Chinese and Japanese go back to killing each other. Thus, after the Japanese swept up the Yangtze and threatened Wuhan, forcing Chiang to withdraw his headquarters and government upriver to Chongqing, Stalin authorized an incursion north south of Vladivostok at the Soviet-Korean border town of Zefeng. After the incident of July 1938, spiraled... Zangu Zangufeng, sorry. There you go. Um, after the incident in July 1938 spiraled into a real battle, pitting 21,000 Red Army troops against 3,000 Japanese, the Japanese held out for a month, long enough to force a postponement of their Yangtze campaign before ceding the town. Stalin celebrated his victory at Lake Kasan, as the Russians called the battle by deporting 200,000 Koreans from the region of Kazakhstan. They held out for a month. I find that to be pretty impressive. Uh, 3,000 Japanese troops against 21,000. You held out for a month. That's not bad. I mean, you're outnumbered seven to one. Yeah. That's incredible. Uh, that speaks really to the tenacity of the Japanese. And again, sort of a, a prelude of what we're going to see with Red Army troops that you can just throw a shitload of bodies at them. So yeah, here's our here's our map. I'm gonna just zoom out real quick so we can see it. Um, yeah. So you've got the incident, Battle of Lake Kassan, 1938, Battle of the Kalkan Goal, which we talked about a little bit in the first episode, May, September 1939. The Japanese invade north of China from Manchuria and going south, Mao's base of operations in the An, uh, Chiang's wartime capital in Chongqing. Uh, after 1938, there's Taiwan, Shanghai, here's Japan. Principal move, uh, principal Japanese troop movements during the invasion of North China. I mean, it's probably worth reflecting on for a, a small moment here that the Soviets and the Japanese are not at war yet. There's no declared conflict here yet. So, like, the Soviets and the Japanese are, are fighting and, and they're killing each other but there's not actually a war on it. Like, this is the same thing with, with Kalk and Gol, which we'll, we'll get to in a, in a moment. But yeah, the same pattern is true. Is There's no actual war, and yet somehow there there's armies of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of men fighting each other in Manchuria and Mongolia. Yeah, and I mean, again, uh, what we're seeing here is th these tactics never went away. The, these things that we're seeing here, they're very similar to things that we still see in today's conflict that, oh, we can deploy troops or deploy, you know, or more na nowadays, it's usually non-state actors. Oh, we can we can fund some terrorists here. We can fund some freedom fighters. We can give them some arms. They'll fight it out for us and they can slaughter each other. The same pattern emerged the following spring after a series of Japanese victories threatened to open new flanks threatening Chongqing from the north and the south. Once again, Stalin authorized a limited incursion against Japanese Manchuria in May 1939, this time on the western side of Soviet Mongolia. The initial Soviet provocation was small. A Mongolian cavalry regiment crossed the Kalkangol River to graze their horses on the steppe, advancing 20 kilometers to the village of Nomohan, before the Kwantung army forced it back to the river. Before crossing back over to Soviet territory, the Mongolians opened fire. The Red Army's 57th Special Corps brought in tanks and warplanes, and before long, a real firefight was underway. The border clash that the Russians referred to as the Battle of Kalkan Gol raged all summer 1939, though it was largely ignored by Western, the Western press. Stalin took the battle seriously enough that he entrusted command to a brilliant young Chukakevsky protege, 
Georgi Zukov, a name that you will know very well in World War II and afterwards. By late July, Zukov had assembled a lethal mechanized force of 58,000 men, including hardened veterans of the Spanish Civil War, which deployed 500 tanks, mostly T-26s used in Spain, and a, a few prototypes of modern Soviet BT-7 and T-34 tanks, 385 armored cars, and 400 warplanes. The Kwatung Army, commanded by General Michitaro Komatsubura, attacked Zhukov's forces on July 1st and 23, failing both times. Zhukov launched his own assault on August 20th. Although the Japanese defenders inflicted heavy losses, Komatsubura had no anti-tank guns and little armor. One Japanese battalion commander tried to mount a Soviet BT-7 tank kamikaze-style with a sword. He did not succeed. What, all, what, a, what a fucking Chad, though, I mean. Yeah, yeah what, what, a, <laughs> what, a, what an absolute way to go. Uh, in all, the Kwatung army suffered 20,000 dead, 41,000 injured or captured out of 75,000 deployed, a casualty rate of 79% against a heavy but lesser Soviet losses of 7,974 killed, 15,251 wounded. Although the war had never been officially declared on September 15, 1939, Tokyo sued for peace. Zhukov was summoned to Moscow and awarded the gold star of the hero of the Soviet Union unbelievable you know that's basically four out of five men dead uh insane and this is Zuka what happens when yeah, you ahead. don't have when you don't have an army that has modern equipment it doesn't matter how many troops you have if you don't have the requisite modern weapons that can defeat your enemy's armor artillery aircraft, etc. You need these assets in order to win. And of course, if you don't have those assets, you're going to take ex exceptionally heavy casualties, which we should think about in, in modern conflicts, of course, with, with certain nations running deficits in artillery and, and uh, ammunition for those artillery pieces. Yeah. Uh, again, it just illustrates that um, manpower can only do so much unless you have the right equipment. Zhukov's victory achieved a number of critical strategic objectives for Stalin. First, by providing relief to Chiang's nationalist for forces, it ensured that the Sino-Japanese war would continue. Chiang even launched a new offensive along the Yangtze River that winter. With predictable cynicism after Zhukov's victory, Stalin curtailed Soviet arms shipments to China. Second, Komatsubara's humiliating defeat all but finished off the Japanese army faction that favored a northern strategy focused on Soviet Russia as the main enemy. The army's Strike North scheme, its main operational plan since the 1920s, had envisioned a rapid conquest of Siberia as far west as Lake Baikal in order to eliminate the communist threat to Asia. This plan was now moot. The Japanese cabinet responsible for the Kalkin Gold debacle fell September 3rd, 1939. No more fighting the Soviets that way. With Stalin disengaging, the Sino-Japanese War drew in other powers concerned about Japanese expansion, including Britain and the United States. This, in turn, strengthened the case for the Japanese Navy faction favoring a Strike South strategy targeting British, Dutch, and American colonies in Southeast Asia. As Bullitt had written Roosevelt before being sacked, it was the hardiest hope of the Soviet government that the United States would become involved with a war in Japan. By making the obvious failure of the Army's northern strategy and strengthening the hand of the Navy faction in Tokyo, Zhukov's triumph made a war far more likely. By removing the Japanese threat to Siberia, Zhukov's triumph also allowed Stalin to concentrate his forces in the West as war clouds gathered over Europe. Even as Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany had been fighting a proxy war in Spain and exchanging ideological salvos in public, Stalin and Hitler had maintained contact through back-channel intermediaries. At the 18th Party Congress in Moscow, March 10, 1939, Stalin mocked the passive non-intervention policy of Western capitalist powers and what he called the Second Imperialist War. The real reason Britain and France had offered Hitler the Sudetenland in Munich, Stalin argued, was as the great price for Germany to wage war against the Soviet Union. A great hullabaloo was being raised in the Western press that Nazi Germany would soon be marching on Soviet Ukraine. But, as the, but the Germans, Stalin guffawed, are refusing to meet their bills, i.e. to invade the Soviet Union, and are sending them to Hades. To Hitler... <laughs> Projection much there, uh, there, Yosef? A little bit. 
Uh, to Hitler, Stalin declared defiantly that we are not afraid of the threats of aggressors. But to the Western capitalist powers, Britain, France, and the U.S., which were all trying, in Stalin's view, to maneuver him to wage war against Hitler, he issued a pointed warning that the Soviet Union would not be drawn into conflicts by warmongers who were accustomed to having others pull the chestnuts out of the fire for them. Really now? Uh, although hmm. we've been doing that with the Chinese. Hmm. 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 Makes you think. Five days after Stalin's chestnut speech, Hitler ordered German troops to occupy Prague and the rest of Czechoslovakia. Enraged at Hitler's betrayal of his Munich promise not to move beyond the Sudetenland, British opinion turned decisively against appeasement. On March 31st, 1939, Chamberlain extended a security guarantee to Poland endorsed by France. Just as Lenin foretold, the rival capitalist blocs stood on the precipice of war. It would not be difficult for Stalin to make them turn their daggers against each other. And that brings us, of course, to the footnotes and the end of this chapter. Wow. Um, yeah, so you can see um, Stalin, it, from what McMeekin is saying here, is they wanted the United States and Japan to go to war even before the war began. This was an explicit goal of theirs. You know, and of course, they did what they needed to do to, to make the Japanese get themselves involved in a southern strategy and a naval based strategy, which inevitably would uh, tread on the toes of Britain, Australia, the Netherlands, and therefore also the United States. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it in the last episode, but there was an American fiction writer that depicted a war between the, so um, the Japanese and the Americans in the 1930s and what that might result in. Uh, but to see Stalin, and I mean, this, this book is clearly crafting that, you know, Stalin was not just some ideological communist rigorist, although, I mean, he obviously was in a lot of extent of his rhetoric, but, you know, we're, we're witnessing, you know, we're not going to let our boys die to achieve our goals. We're going to masterfully let the Chinese fight the Japanese for us. We're going to test out our equipment and our, in our officer corps and our, our armored divisions in Spain. We're going to see how well our equipment can hold up against the Germans or the Italians and see what needs to be improved while at the same time getting the best kind of industrial powers uh, to give us the technology we need for us, whether that be the Americans, the French or the British for weapons, aircraft and, uh, you know, propellers and uh, piston engines. It really is a damning indictment that the Soviets had a, a far greater command of the chessboard than anyone in the West had probably expected outside of a very few number of intelligent statesmen and foreign officers that would later be sacked for political expediency or because they were not in on board with the Roosevelt administration's desire to have a more peaceful relationship with, with the Soviets. Uh, and this is on top of the fact that international communism is exactly what it is. It's international. It will penetrate everything, as we've seen in the previous uh, video when it came to the American government and its academia and industry, uh, that the West, in the midst of the interwar period, was brutally unprepared on how to respond to a foreign power that had the capability of infiltration, uh, espionage, and conducting proxy warfare very effectively, as McMeekin has illustrated. Uh, I, I really don't know what else to add there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely damning. Absolutely damning. I mean, it, it the way that McMeekin kind of frames Stalin, like, makes Stalin out to be much more of an evil genius than he's commonly portrayed to be. Um, you know, he's got... And, and of course, this is where the perception of the red juggernaut comes from, right? Which is, it doesn't matter what you do. It does, they, they outnumber you. They have more guns than you. They have more tanks than you. They, um, they're subverting you from within. It, you know, So it's just this idea that th the Soviet Union is, is undefeatable. And I think, I think that largely that's a lot of... Um, that doesn't, as we'll get into, that isn't really borne out by the actual facts... But that's the mythology of it, right? And that's what we remember. Um, and is what is implanted firmly in, in the folk memory of, of everybody. Um, the, you know, 
common mythology. Yeah. Well, we'll continue on. Uh, I will have probably another guest. Um, then we'll put you in rotation, Mr. Mandrill. I have a few others lined up, um, but we'll be covering chapter two next, huge and hateful, and the uh, discussion of the Molotov Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. So we're we're now getting into some of the more interesting diplomatic parts of uh, Nazi Soviet history, and it'll it'll be good. So if you want to see these videos early, I always recommend that you head on over to Subscribestar, Substack. Um, and of course, YouTube channel memberships. You can all see these videos a week early before they premiere. And with that, Mr. Mandrill, where can people find you and your work? Uh, as always, you can find me uh, on the Old Glory Club's Substack uh, and their YouTube channel on for Pony Express on Thursdays. Uh, other than that, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Telegram. You can find me on Gab, all the usual places. I do have my own Substack and my own YouTube channel, which uh, I do things on. Uh, if speaking of um, of Stalin's war, I think uh, upcoming this month I have a stream planned with Hitman um, on the nine principles of war. Uh, uh, when when that comes out, that'll be I'll make sure that to retweet that. But um, if you're interested in going over the actual nine principles of war. Uh, as listed in U.S. Army do uh, documentation and, and how the U.S. military thinks of these wars. And if you want somebody who actually understands it and can apply it in, in real-life situations um, or to real-life battles, uh, that will be an interesting stream, and I'm very much looking forward to it, actually. Uh, Hitman is a great channel, and I'm, I'm looking forward to going on for that stream. Well, there you go, and I will have his Find My Friends links down below in the description for this video. But until then, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue on this dive into Sean McMeekin's Stalin War, uh, Stalin's War. So stay tuned, be sure to subscribe, and if you want to see these videos early, head on down below at the links of Substack, Subscribestar, as well as YouTube channel memberships. You can join the frog tier, get access to videos. And on occasion, on Fridays, I, I do a little game stream, so you get to see those two uh, behind the paywall. But until then, I will see you all in the next video. See you, gents.